Hey guys, I hope you all had a good Christmas. Mine was probably the roughest I've ever had due to travel and busyness in general, but it was so other people could have a good experience, which is necessary sometimes. So this is an interview I recorded about six months ago with a very like-minded brother when it comes to a philosophy of story uh, in whatever medium you might have. Uh, I don't think I've ever actually read any of his books since they're not targeted for me, but I really appreciate the thought and intention behind them. Uh, I think I alluded to this on the interview with Stefan Kinsella about copyrights. I work in film and TV. I have an IMDb profile and all that. Don't hold it against me, but I bring it up to say if you're in the production space at all, or even if you just really like watching movies or reading novels or just watching the news, I think you'll find this to be a fun and interesting conversation because of how much of an underpinning story is to our theology and how we understand it. Uh, it is the primary way that God communicates to us in scripture, after all. We get into presuppositionalism near the end and how people arrive at their positions of faith, and I just think story is an excellent tool in any storyteller's or theologian's belt. Deuteronomy 4, 5-8 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. My name is Andy Wilson. I write novels, produce kids TV, uh, nature documentaries, that kind of thing. Hello uh, Ninja, right? Yeah, the Hello Netflix. Ninja on Netflix. Some other stuff in the works. Uh, Riot in the Dance, Christian nature documentary series that I'm quite excited about. Um, then I would say, okay, so my testimony is born into a generationally Christian home, uh, a genuine one, a real one, no hypocrisy, no anger, no rage, no darkness back there. So never saw my parents fight, never saw my dad angry. Like that, that's my testimony. <laughs> so what that means, and my grandfather was the same way, uh, old school evangelist. And all my aunts and uncles were believers on, you know, both sides and just, I never, never saw the, the back or the background brokenness that every single TV developer would weave into the, the backstory of their protagonist. Inevitably, there's just not a broken window back there. Right. There was poverty. <laughs> you know, it's like we were dirt poor, um, lived in a tiny little shoebox, and you know, I, I got, I have vivid memories of uh, getting a bag of rubber bands for Christmas, things like that, you know, and I loved it. You know, that That's was the I important was, thing. I was pretty fired up. Yeah. So we were dirt poor. Uh, 
but there was no in that poverty there's none of of what hollywood would weave into a setup like that so the gospel was presented to us as fact at a very early age but all see here comes the first sneeze see what happens uh no okay we're good um it was presented to us at a very early age and all questions were welcome you know my father had a master's in philosophy it wasn't we were fundamentalists but not in a frightened retreating kind of way um uh, yeah, it's hard to think of us as fundamentalists, but we were meaning like we, we what what the world thinks of when they think fundamentalists is not what we were somebody who's withdrawing and sort of plugging their ears going la 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 right and they would also immediately assume like no rock and roll, you know, no rock and roll, no alcohol, no dancing. Uh, alcohol was fine. My dad loved the blues loved rock and roll Stevie Ray Vaughan was often blasting in the home. BB King, you know. So we were not retreatists, you know, at all. My parents were not. When I was eight, I believe it was, my dad sat me on the couch and turned on MTV and we were watching MTV together. And he was asking me to analyze the worldviews of the videos. So that's the kind of retreatists we were. Like I remember watching Peter Gabriel talking head stuff and him asking me what it means and what the symbolism means and unpack the images and you know, the lyrics and all that stuff and just talking us through it, my older sister, uh, and, and me. So that's the kind of house we were in. Uh, dad would read us stories all the time. C.S. Lewis, you know, stories out loud stories were big stories all the time. So poor people, poor pastor and his family, uh, but very happy, no brokenness gospel clearly presented presented as something that was truth and we needed to accept and and receive and i think by the age of six might have been a little earlier i told my dad that i kind of wanted to be a half christian and meaning that well at the time i just thought i kind of want to do whatever i want but be able to go in and out <laughs> and you know he laughed at me and he wasn't he was not worried about it it was not something that was really you know, he, he knew that God had me, that I belonged to Christ. And he told me that, and he was just waiting. Um, so eventually I ended up professing faith explicitly and getting baptized in a river that's currently on fire, uh, up in, you know, about an hour North of here in the woods, Laird park. And, um, you know, it, it was one of those baptistic homes where professions of faith are not discounted or not rejected or not attacked are not intellectually defeated by grownups. I like professed where's the fruit. Yeah. I, profe they I, I professed faith. They didn't call me a liar. You know, they said, okay, we're going to take you at your word and we're going to hold you to that, hold you to that with your behavior and everything else. And they did. So that is really my testimony, which is, I am an apple that fell off of an apple tree that fell off of another apple tree where there was no deep hypocrisy or brokenness or reason to rage and, and doubt what I was being given. So you saw it lived out and then I saw it lived it out, but I was also matched. Yep. But I was also in a very real way. If we're just, if we're talking about the story, I'm a Christian because my parents were Christians and because they disciplined me in love and taught me to be a Christian. Um, but if we go intellectually, the other thing they did is they taught me to defend my faith. They taught me to question. They taught me to investigate and to not simply accept things. And so critical thinking was key. Well, it sounds like that when they, when your dad sits you down with MTV yeah. and it's like, well, okay, let's be discerning. Yep. Let's see what's going on. here. Yeah. Tell me what's going on. What's Peter Gabriel trying to say? And is it true? And where's he coming from? Yeah. Where's he coming from? Is it true? How is he saying it? Uh, by junior high, I was being taught formal logic and, you know, informal fallacies and then on down through philosophy a lot around the dinner table and so on. So it was never, I always felt thoroughly equipped to engage with any question I might have and any question anybody else might have. I, I knew how to question, how to search, how to discuss, 
how to discover, how to think. And so I never, I never felt like the flashlights were off, you know, and I was just groping around. Um, and that's been a tremendous blessing. Something I try to give to my own kids. You mentioned in an interview, I think it was back in 2016 with Joe Rigney. Um, he asked you, I think where the writing purpose started for you. Mm. Um, you said you were in fifth grade. Your dad wouldn't let you complain about books that you hated. <laughs> yep. Uh, unless you provided an alternative of how you would do things differently, yep. how you would rewrite it. Um, are there other things in your life or your kids' lives that you've applied that same lesson to? Don't oh, complain yeah. unless you're willing to do something, basically. Oh, yeah. That's kind of a standard, it's a standard thing. It's a standard parent move. No complaining. Be constructive. But specific to film and story, that is also something I do with my kids. So if you don't like something, what should it be? How should it have gone? Oh, uh, sure. Find the flaws or find the things that are not to your taste, but don't bring them unless you actually have a, a creative suggestion that would improve it. And then be able to defend that, which is also important. I think your dad, he steered, I'm sure he steered you in a lot of different directions. Why did the writing one stick? Cause I think I was made for it. So, I mean, that's the thing that really resonated. That's the thing I loved. If somebody wants to be a musician and they try a couple of different instruments and they, they don't stick and then suddenly one does, you know, it's like, well, I kind of like this, but you know, I, I could take it or leave it. I did it for a couple of years and whatever. And then somebody's like, but the banjo, <laughs> I, I play for fun every night. I work on it. And for me, writing was a bit that way, especially in the, uh, in the thought life and the internal processes of invention and daydreaming and, and world building, mapping character arcs, that kind of thing. That's just something I can't stop doing. I actually don't have the ability to stop. And so like, I think that's why it stuck. <laughs> so you write mainly young adult fiction. Yeah. And I actually, I'm working on one right now, but technically it's middle grade, which as far as the world is concerned is not different. You know, it's like Harry Potter is middle grade, not young adult, but so what, you know, that's a publishing distinction as opposed to like a consumer, a consumer distinction. Okay. So it's a little bit of a market difference of, and so, you know, hunger games is considered young adult YA and Harry Potter is not, it's middle grade. So the question is like, where's the base, your youngest readership where like, how young are you aiming? middle grade really tries to get into that, you know, eight to 10 year old space too. So Narnia Chronicles, that kind of thing, as opposed to uh, aiming at 13 and up or 12 and 13, uh, junior high, like am I targeting junior high kids or am I targeting kids in the fifth grade? So uh, I do, I'd say I started there. I've definitely done the most work there and I've been all over the map. You know, I've, I've done, a lot of things. So I'm currently working on adult, you know, philosophy of religion, nonfiction. Um, you could say philosophy of religion, memoir <laughs> of third book. That's like that, that I've done picture books for little kids. You know, hello ninja is, is riffed off of one of those, um, nature documentaries, some feature film of that, that kind of thing. Do you have a, a favorite versus what the marketing numbers say <laughs> are the best. Uh, so right now I would say 100 cupboards is the biggest of the novels and in just raw numbers, the biggest, but is it your favorite? Well, this I'm answering the question here. Okay. It's the biggest in terms of the numbers of the novels. Hello Ninja is bigger than it is uh, because it has a show supporting it. And I have to love everything I'm creating when I'm creating it. And so it's kind of interesting. Uh, they're, they're all things that you had to love and you have to love equally when you're putting it out into the world. Otherwise you're, you may as well just put it back on the, on the bulletin board and not work on it. So it's very similar to which of my kids is my favorite. You know, it's like, well, which one's in front of you at the I time? I can't, yeah, I can't have a favorite. I'm not allowed to have a favorite, but yeah, I'm going to treat every single one of each of them that's in front of me. Like, you know, they're as important to me as they are. So they're all the same. And I say that, but then it's also a little bit not true because they come in different parts of your life with different struggles. 
And so they imprint on you differently. And so there's, they're valued, their value is different because did it come easily? And it's like, oh, I love that one because it came easily. And then this one, like, oh man, it came with just great hardship and struggle. This was really difficult. So I value it also, but in a completely different way. So the Outlaws, the Outlaws of Time trilogy, which I published with HarperCollins, is a is highly valued to me. I value it a lot. And I value it a lot because it was the biggest struggle. It was the hardest journey because that's when my brain started fully malfunctioning. I ended up with a brain tumor and you know, it was a whole big struggle to even finish the trilogy. So that has a different kind of value than my first book, Lee Pike Ridge, which I love because it's my first book and also because it came so easily. <laughs> I mean, it just started one night and started coming on its own accord. And, you know, the writing was super simple. When I say the term Christian movie, right? What do you think of? I think of other podcasts I've given. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I think of, of chariots fire. And I think of, uh, tender mercies, a uh, little independent film out of Florida called sweet land. Um, uh, die hard <laughs> tombstone. So wait, 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 <laughs> I have to say, wait, even though I'm nodding in agreement, <laughs> why, why does die hard get included in there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's a question for you. Uh, movies can't, repent to be baptized. So they're not Christians. So what do you mean when you ask the question? Uh huh. And you left it open. So you asked what it means to me. Like, right. What do I think of? And right. This is what I think of. Why do you think most people have a different understanding than you do? Or I guess I should say than we do because they treat the word Christian the way the industry does, which is as a market tag as a genre. It's a, yeah, it's a market tag. And it means this movie is for mega churches or middle-aged women between 30 and 50. Really? Actually, that's a little generous of you. <laughs> uh, a one middle-aged woman who's 35, whose name is Kathy, <laughs> whose name is, whose, whose name is Kathy and no joke, Kathy, the 35 year old woman who represents the cultural decision maker in evangelical homes in the Bible belt. And she is that totem that, that, uh, evangelical marketers use. So that's yeah, it goes for Christian music too. Christian radio play. You got to make Kathy happy. If Kathy's happy, then you're succeeding. Um, so Christian as a marketing tag, meaning can we get Joel Osteen to, to bus his people to this movie? That's what the industry means. And what I mean by it is something that imitates uh, both the narrative structure, theme and typological architecture imitates uh, the stories God tells and whether or not, in fact, tells the truth. Like, is it telling the truth about the world God made? Or there's a there's a man who's fighting for his bride. And so he goes and he takes a hundred foreskins <laughs> of his dead enemies and he plops them down at the feet of his would be father-in-law and says, I would yeah. like a wife, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is this a Christian story or is this, is this not a Christian story? Yeah, I'm talking exactly. about David, by the way. So if you, you know, if you're the guy who fought the lion in the pit on the snowy day, if you're Shamgar, if you're Samson, oh, uh, it's not JL. even just, yeah, if you're not, not even just not even just King, King David and Goliath, you know, you, th you think in terms of a woman who is in a tent and a King arrives in her tent, fleeing the battle and she functionally seduces him, but not sexually just like, here's some milk, take yeah, a nap, please. Yeah. She, she basically mothers him into sleeping and then drives a tent bag through his skull with a mallet. <laughs> And, like, and then it sticks in the ground. It goes all the way through. Yeah. It's like, whoo, that woman's got a swing. Let me just say that woman's got you a swing. You had to think what was going through her. She's like, should I call my husband? No, no it's I got fine. this. I've got a tent peg over here. I got some warm milk. We're set. 
I don't want to risk him escaping. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the story of a prostitute in Jericho, you know, lying, lying to the Gestapo Christian story of Ruth misbehaving it with Boaz Christian story of the crucifixion itself is not, is not one that uh, Sony Provident would green light, you know, and there, or a lot of the quote unquote Christian audience, the Karen <laughs> would go to go, would go to see, or you yep. didn't say Karen, you said, uh, Kathy, Kathy. Yeah. Kathy, she might have to change her name cause it's too close to Karen now, <laughs> but it's, uh, and even there, it's kind of funny cause the passion like proper is, is one that, uh, ran the gauntlet of all sorts of different markets and got watched by everybody. But it's, um, so when I think Christian movie, I think be contrary, refuse to think in the categories of the marketplace, which I think are false and unhelpful. And because the market is what has been, not what will be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, but the market is also arbitrarily established. The rules of the market arbitrarily established by gatekeepers who are often not themselves Christians, but who are really gifted at manipulating large groups of people of, you know, who share unique demographics into watching a film. And so it's, you know, that's what Christian has come to mean in front of movie, which is unfortunate. Yeah. I tend to think of somebody that's analyzing the market. They can only do so in a dead way. Like they have to translate it into numbers at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But it's like, okay, you stick a, a frog in a blender and then you divide it into its constituent parts. And that's what analyzing the market is. But now the frog's dead. Yeah. <laughs> and can you tell what its favorite food was based on its chemical makeup? Maybe. <laughs> but you'd have to get a microscope out and do some really, really particular testing. Right. And it is it is unfortunate. But it's also, uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between the written story and a visualized story. So I understand why particular Old Testament stories would not do well in the Christian market if you were to film them, nor should they. Uh, but I want to love the kind of stories that God loves. I want to tell the kind of stories that God tells. And ultimately, that's what being a Christian means is trying to be more like God, you know, belonging to him, obeying him and trying to imitate him and bring glory to him. So when I'm telling stories and I'm writing stories, I often and am asked by Kathy, uh, why does it have to be so scary? Why does it have to be so intense? Why is there so much violence? Why is it so, why is the darkness so very dark? You know, that kind of thing. Cause then the brightness can be brighter. Cause it's supposed to be <laughs> cause darkness is in fact very dark. What are some specific passions of yours within story? Like what do you hope readers come away with after reading your work specifically? I hope readers come away with a truly visceral experience that becomes a, an owned memory. So where I can vicariously give them experiences that get all the way into their bones and all the way into the DNA of their imaginations and they can feel them as vividly in 40 years as they can right now. I want to, I want to give people the gift of experiencing something that they didn't experience and couldn't. I think that's how humans are wired. That's why we watch the news, isn't it? Yeah. What I think we, I think we watch, I think, I think we watch the news because we're, we're gossips and, and storm crows, right? Carrying birds. I think we are sucked into story because God made us in a way that's, I think truly bizarre and a really interesting choice such that we remember things more deeply that, that arrived into like arrived came through the doorway in, into our beings through the imagination rather than through our own experience. So or when everything's jumbled up, it's like, here, here's a puzzle I'm going to drop in your lap. Now you got to parse everything out. Yeah. You figure it out. I'm not giving it to you codified and yep. So what was it like? Do you have a favorite novel? Hmm. Or just a top Prob novel. Probably Harry Potter. So Harry Potter's up there. You already will remember scenes from Harry Potter more clearly than you remember some of your own birthdays and some of your own recent birthdays. And last Wednesday, 
or last Tuesday, unless <laughs> unless there was something that really really marked the day, right? You know, unless, unless something extremely vivid jumped out such that it scarred you or left, like it put a tattoo on you because you were there when some you know something horrible happened and it you know really imprinted. We go through our day constantly experiencing through our five senses plus you know the sixth sense and a little bit extra. And then we we have like a short term memory flush. We just wipe stuff constantly. And story is is a way of marking without trauma. So you can mark your memory and you can receive experience and it stays with you for as long as your brain functions. And it will stay with you as as if it had the heft of a significant, significant day. So it would take a brutal car wreck it would take some horrible thing to make a day in your life as clearly remembered as a good kid's book. And so God built us in a way that our imagination gets to scar tissue. It gets, it gets into you and marks you and shapes you like a really traumatic experience, but without having to actually break your bones. And so our own days we go through and forget, but we don't do that with, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which is, I think, weird, and one of the reasons why I love, I love writing stories. Yeah, it's the it's the shortcut, and I guess it's well, it's obviously the way that God's chosen to communicate with us, though it happened for real. Yeah, and then, uh, hopefully, it sticks with people, and so only one person had to deal with this, and then, yeah. It's sort of actually, like a vaccine for really, really awful situations. He prioritizes story and narrative such that storytellers, preachers, prophets are the, they are the, the ones with the, um, well, the, with the branding iron, with the little, the tattoo gun, <laughs> like they're, they're the ones who are retelling things and, and stories in the retelling like you can be there and it's retold and that's how it sticks. So when something really amazing happens or striking happens, compelling happens, one of the first and most important things you can do is tell it because in the telling is how you, is how you like file it and how you remember it. So you, that's, that's how you put a little pin in it and mark it so that you can get back there and remember it again and tell it again. And that goes for things God's done. That goes for, the gospel that goes for everything from the first century that goes for George Washington. Like he'll only be remembered in the telling. Yeah. You don't have control of your own story. Once you're gone. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> Are Tolkien and Lewis still your favorite authors? They're up there. I mean, Lewis definitely, uh, parts of, uh, parts of the Lord of the Rings are definitely, uh, the, the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. How was Tolkien, in your understanding, able to to sort of capitalize on uh, style? Like, why is it that something in fantasy has so much staying power? One of the reasons why I think it sticks is because he, he imitates God's story so effectively in using the foolish things. And so he begins with the hobbits. And it's this very kind of playful caricature of the hobbits who are very much uh, English villagers. You know, they're, they're human. These are not hobbits. These are humans and they're humans caricatured in a certain way. And so they like to garden. Yeah. They're rather, very simple. They don't like some stress. of them like the garden. They all like to drink. They all like to eat. They all like to smoke. And it's very, they have no ambition. They have no ambition to like get outside their village. They just, want to tend this spot. So he does that. And I think that is the gateway to everybody caring. That's the gateway of connectivity. And everybody feels like, yep, I, you know, this is accessible. It's within reach less, uh, wise authors try to get an, in, like an intense sensation of stakes and seriousness early on. And the chosen one, you know, they, they really try to get there way too fast and not 
create a truly human and earthy entry point. So because he did that, and then he went from there and got to enormous peaks of epic bravery and sacrifice and huge stakes. It's, it's not an accident that a lot of people have thought he was, he was writing uh, allegory for World War II. You know, very simple village people getting sent off into this massive global existential fight. He denied it, but it definitely was in his bones. You know, it's definitely, it definitely affected him. So he, he had wisdom from that, that, that shows up there. So I think that he captures the same kind of escalation from truly human beginnings to enormous existential conflict. He captures it the way it actually happens, the way it actually goes. And that's something he knew because of his experience with war um, and not World War II. You know, it's like, it's not, this is not based off World War II. And anybody who pays attention to his biography would know that. It's like the, I think it's, it would be sociologically, it'd be more inspired by World War I anyway. Uh, the, the ultimate destruction of kingdoms that no longer exist. Uh, empires. You know, I think that's all in his DNA. And so while he had wisdom from what was going on around him in the recent, you know, recent history and context, um, which is World War II, I think there's actually something that he throws his imagination a little further back. Uh, but yeah, he's riffing off of Norse and Saxon and, you know, Saxon types and Norse stories and, and, but then making it so immediately real to people who have seen things like it, but with different props. And you also mentioned that one of the things that you prefer about his and C.S. Lewis's stories is that you have a very normal, relatable character and yep. the world goes nuts Yeah. rather than what most people try to do today, which is you've got this unique, un Super misunderstood unique. Yeah. Uh, main character and a very normal, boring world. Yep. And they happen to the world. Yeah. And that's actually, that's Chesterton's uh, distinction between a fairy tale and a modern story. It's like normal character, world goes nuts, uh, abnormal, extreme outlier character. They happen to the world. What frustrates you about that? I think there's a place for it. I don't think it's ever as compelling um, as the as the fairy tale, but there's a place for it because God does it. You know, it's like that's that's Samson. Uh, that's the whole messianic story you know it's not it's not the way chesterton described it as somebody who's deeply tortured and super unique and the world is boring and they smash it which is you know the modern psychological story but um there are those stories those messianic stories that are the true outlier you know the chosen one ratatouille yeah king david samson jesus ratatouille <laughs> same category yeah. Versus actually, it's kind of funny to say this versus Nemo, you know, which is the other, you know, so it's a uh, super talented trapped happening to the world versus, uh, versus very normal, not super special. How would superhero movies fit into that? Is yeah, they, they're so bastardized at this point. It's tough, but as a genre, it's all book of judges. It all originated with uh, Jewish boys telling stories of the God man coming. Uh, people who missed the boat of the actual Messiah, sadly, like spinning tales of Messiahs, of a Messiah coming. And it is all riffed off of judges. It's all straight out of the Old Testament. And then it starts wearing tights and then becomes wearing bright colors, a little homoerotic. And uh, then just gets weirder and weirder until we are where we are today. I think, wasn't that the original intent behind X-Men when it was created, which was to provide an analogy for the normalization of homosexuality? I don't know. I mean, I, I could, I could say X-Men too, sure watches that way, but I'm not a comic book guy. So I've not, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't speak to the origins of X-Men. You have to get Darren down for something like that. <laughs> I, I remember reading that somewhere, but uh, it was on the internet. So, so who uh, knows? Who knows? 
Yeah. Lou Rockwell. He's a political yeah. uh, theorist, libertarian. Some areas he's biblical, but he wants a different word for it. He once challenged Christians, Calvinists specifically, where he said, uh, you guys like to think that there's only a Christian way to do everything. And he said, is there only a Christian way to fly a plane or can, can plane flying ethics come from an unbeliever as well? And I would apply that to story and ask you that. Is there only a Christian way to write movies or is there also an unchristian way? There are ways that honor God and there are ways that don't. So it's that binary. It's also a lot more complicated than that. When you get down into it, it's gonna be more granular. Well, yeah. When you get into the, it's more like a symphony. So like which notes and which sequence and which part are you talking about? Well, and that's the, I would say that's the, that would be within the wisdom of how to do it Christian way. Cause it's now we're talking about wisdom Yep. and what's the best way to do it. But here's what it comes down to. If we want to keep it binary for Lou, and we can keep a binary for Lou at the end of the day, only one thing matters. And that is, does God like it or does God not like it? Like at the end, when all the granular bits and everything's in the stew, when you've thrown it all in there, there's only one, there's only one reviewer that matters. Pilot takes a plane up and crashes and kills all his passengers. <laughs> Pilot, so a pilot flying, a plumber plumbing, any, a drywaller drywalling, any of those things, you can do it in a way that pleases God or you can do it in a way that displeases God. And does that make your drywalling Christian? It's like, you know, well, I wouldn't, I don't use that word for things that cannot repent and be baptized. Uh, it's the fruits of a Christian. Yeah, exactly. It's God honoring. And so I would say it's God, it's God honoring or it's God dishonoring. Oh, uh, it, it causes God, it brings God pleasure or it does not. And it's, this is not complicated. So, you know, it's one of those things where uh, this, this is holds true for coyotes. You know, it's like there's, there's going to be coyotes that are running the hills and bring God pleasure. And there's going to be moments when they eat their young and do not bring God pleasure. You know, like that's just everything. A weaver bird can bring God pleasure or not. Now, uh, if we're going into the Old Testament, you see that animals can be judged uh, for their behavior. The cap capital punishment can be applied to animals. And we still do that. You know, when the ox scores a man. Yeah, but we do that in the wild. If a grizzly bear kills a person, we go find that bear and we put that bear down and doesn't matter where they are. Like, this is just not, this is not allowed. It's not tolerated. And, uh, we've done that with sharks. We've done that with grizzlies. We've done that with lions. We treat them that way. There is, there is a capital punishment to it. Uh, and animals can honor God and dishonor God. They can bring him pleasure and they can not bring him pleasure. So, if they can surely, you know, plumbers and drywallers and storytellers can and pilots. So, so if you tell a bad enough story, we can come kill you. So a pilot could be lazy. <laughs> yeah. A pilot could be lazy. Uh, a pilot could have a couple drinks. A pilot could be harassing the flight attendants. You know, a pilot could be self-absorbed and forget that he's serving people. There's plenty of things. It was short of crashing that wouldn't please God and would not arise from libertarian ethics, which is all about service of the self. Selfishness is Ayn Rand called it the virtue of selfishness. Yep. Who were some of your in writing specifically? I know you, you mentioned your dad was very, an in, very influential mentor for you in writing specifically. Are there people that you have read? to get tips or tricks or methodologies for how you think about story? Hmm. Um, 
I mean, there's resources. There's literary resources. Uh, that giant book, The Seven Basic Plots, The Painted Word by Tom Wolfe. Oh, uh, there's there's books like that, but overwhelmingly it's just watching people do it who affected me. Where I read something and read some lines and it's like, man, those are sticky. Why why do those work so well? And I kind of take them apart and play around with them. So Steinbeck in Cannery Row was a big one. Uh, but I've never been a person who really reads books on writing. I don't think I've ever finished reading one. Uh, apart from my dad's wordsmithy, which is all stuff I was familiar with, but I was reading it to see what he was publishing. So, yeah, I don't think I've ever finished. I mean, I, I tried. I got given in an elective. I got given the writer's journey and some other stuff, and I was just like, I can't get through this. So, I like the work. I like to actually go do the work and not to stare at the work. Or And, and people's techniques are hidden in there stories yeah. or not hidden at all just right on the surface and sometimes you can be a lot more honest about them than they can it's hard to see the back of your own head yep it's rather easy for everybody else <laughs> do you get fan mail i do for a while i aspired to be like c.s lewis and respond to fan mail that's just not possible i don't know how he did it but I like to think that it, it's that he wouldn't if if he lived now. Well, it cost people money to write him back then, <laughs> <laughs> right? But I get plenty of mail and envelopes, you know, where they they suck a stamp on it. But I get far more, you know, just all the digital messages across everything, and I do what I can to try to respond. Uh, but it's still super hit and miss because I'll. I'll have a moment, I'll be sipping a coffee and I'll be like switching between one project and another. And I'll check my Facebook messages or something and respond to the top three and then have to get back to work and, you know, just move on and then never go back. <laughs> so I apologize to anybody who's ever tried to message me because it's not easy. This is why I'm doing this because I tried writing him several times. And <laughs> he never responded. So, <laughs> so I can say, actually, I'm, this I'm is kidding. not, and I'm not <laughs> bragging. This is not a brag. This is just a situation. Uh, at the moment, I have 561 unread text messages. So, and 375 unlistened to voicemails. And it starts to be futile. You know, you're just kind of like, well, what am I going to do? I'm not going to tell you how many unread emails there are. So my wife does significant battle to try to make sure that that I respond to the right things. And she, she is an intercessor for various children who have been persistent. Um, but I think everybody would rather me actually just be doing the work. So. Yeah, well, um, how many of those messages are, when's your next <laughs> such and such coming out? I don't know, because I haven't read them. <laughs> Have you, do you have a feel for what resonates the most with people based on those feedback? Not based on the feedback. I, I still rightly or wrongly, I still base everything on my own reaction to stories. So then watching what people are doing in film and TV and fiction. And there's, I don't mean to be a snob, but if I'm going to put my snob hat on, there are stories that last and there are stories that are really fantastic that don't necessarily succeed in the moment. And I think the best, like the truly best stories will rarely, if ever be the most popular when they're coming out. They grow over time. Yep. I think they're going to, they're going to grow and they're going to take, they take over over time. Um, so it doesn't matter to me that, you know, the next novel by fill in the blank, some novelist I respect doesn't hit the New York times list. I could read it and think like, man, this is going to be around forever. And I could look at what is at the top of the New York times list and say, that is the result of a cocktail of 
pre-existing placement relationships, summer beach and lake house reading, uh, mommy bloggers, you know, going viral around something because it's the it, the it thing for this summer. This is the big, it's hot girl summer. And so this is the, and this is the book that, that slides into that spot. And so there are books like wonder, for example, where I think the first print run was like under 2000 copies. And I, I hope I'm not just making that up. I think it was like 1800 copies. So she can reach out to me and tell me that I'm wrong if that's the case, but tens of millions now. And I mean, that was a publisher who was not believing in it at all. You know, just putting this book out there and, and the way it struck a chord with people and just went, uh, was really all due to the story that she told. Will it be around in 20 years in the same way? I think she hit a moment. So I don't think she'll be around like Lewis is around in 70 years. And I think Lewis will still be around in 70 years. Uh, and I've seen sales numbers around particular titles for CS Lewis and it's amazing. And so you have, it's sometimes they're tougher to get, but you have in the year the Martian came out, uh, you have a Matt Damon blockbuster, like successful film in that year, uh, screw tape letters, mere Christianity and the great divorce all outsold the Martian <laughs> and with no marketing three quarters of a century since release. And they're just going and going and going. And that's phenomenal. I mean, it really is. So were they the most popular books of the summer when they came out? Were they the most popular books of the year? They were successful. I mean, screw tape took off pretty quick. Mere Christianity took off pretty quick, but the fact that they just go and go and go is uh, is truly mind blowing. So it's, uh, you know, all this, all this to say a movie like children of men comes out and doesn't blow up the box office, but man, I love it. And it's a great piece of art and it has the respect of a great piece of art from all movie lovers. Yeah. Before I had ever even seen the movie, you had seen the behind the scenes about how they did that car yeah. chase Yeah, where they're having to back up and people are getting shot and yeah, but it didn't, on top of the car, but it didn't scratch the itch of wish fulfillment and flattery of an audience that you have to do to get a, a huge global audience to move from all different cultures. Like we've, if you're trying to market something to the lowest common denominator, we all know that the snack that sells the most in gas stations is not the best for you. It's not the highest quality. We all know that if you're talking about food and consumption, the very best meal in a town is not the most commonly sold. You know, we, everybody knows that when it comes to food. And I think the same standard applies to soul food, which is what stories are. Yeah. I think it's, that kind of matches the design of the gospel. Yeah. You've got the secret things that only a few people find the way and it's the best thing for you, but it's probably also the most bitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is hard. This is a hard pill to swallow. Take it. It will give you life, but after you die, <laughs> what are the type of people that don't resonate with your work or are vocally opposed? The super pious, the kind of people who would rather not read the old Testament. You know, they just want to skip it. They, they don't like it. People who don't believe in who are thoughtful and very intentional in their unbelief about objective truth and beauty who really want to see everything subverted and twisted. So a book is not interesting to them or a movie is not interesting to them unless it's subverting and, or inverting paradigms and trying to call what's good, bad and bad, good. And up, you know, up is down and down is up. And there are a lot of creators in the world where that's, that's where they get their pleasure. That's where they scratch their itch is I'm going to take this horrible, horrible person. I'm going to make you like them. 
you know, I'm going to make, I'm going to make you loyal to them and follow them through horrible, awful things and give you this vicarious, uh, vice tourism experience. Can you think of a story example like that? Uh, well, the Godfather franchise did that despite Scorsese's attempts to have that not be the case, uh, where it became a celebration of a particular way of life instead of a cautionary tale. You know, it wasn't what he what he says he wanted to do. Uh, Breaking Bad, mm-hmm. you know, well told, well crafted, extremely well executed. Um but is giving people uh, the experience of, of, uh, and the wish fulfillment of being a drug dealer and being amazing at it and going on this dark, dark ride that ends in death. And wasn't that fun. I've talked to people. I haven't watched the, that series, but I've talked to people who have and love it, but they love it for the cautionary tale aspect. And like, yeah, this, is this stuff say. is really cool. That's what they say. But, they don't love it for the cautionary tale aspect. They defend it. They defend their love of it through the cautionary tale. I'm super cynical hmm. about this. Hmm. All of us, all human beings, take our positions emotionally. Everybody. I don't care if you're the most hyper rationalistic atheist. I don't care if you're me and you're Mr. Philosophy Club Christian. We all ultimately assume our positions initially out of a out of you know, emotional and narratival impulses, affections. We arrive at our positions out of the affections and then we proceed to defend them. <laughs> logically. Yeah, logically. And we don't move unless our affections change. So it doesn't matter how much our logic sucks. We don't change our minds. Mm. We won't unless, uh, because that's not the cause of our belief. It's all, all it is, is the, you know, the smoke machine we're using to keep other people from dislodging us from our belief. And so we're, whether we're being super logical or we're, we're using valid syllogisms or whatever, I assume a position and then I defend it logically. And if it's shown to be false or invalid, I have to rethink my position. Uh, logic reason is a witness. It's, it testifies for or against the position I've already taken. And I have to have the humility to move, you know, if it testifies against it. But that's not how we come to things. So when people watch a show and that show grabs them by their senses, by their imagination and drags them through an experience, which they loved afterwards, they have to try to, well, find a way to keep it and keep that experience, <laughs> keep that experience intact and, uh, intact in the same world as their worldview and so on. And so it's like, well, it's a cautionary tale. How many seasons long was it? At what point did you get the caution? <laughs> <laughs> like, were there new layers to this caution? What, like, what was it, you know? And the writers say, ultimately it's nihilism. And then Christians are like, no, 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 no. They don't know what they're talking about. It was, it's the only reason why I don't do meth. But <laughs> you know, what? That took a lot of money for yeah. that PSA. <laughs> yeah. Just, Meth is bad. It's the only reason why I too don't cook perfect meth and make tons of money and live. Even though as much as I would love to. <laughs> yes. And live in this adrenaline fueled, amazing New Mexican saga. It's like, really? That's, oh, come on, man. Like that's, we don't, we don't need that many seasons of a drug PSA to get the cautionary tale. I'm thinking back now, somebody recommended that I watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Right. And great film, by the way, <laughs> when filtered, <sighs> I showed my kids. So I watched it. And like, as the movie's going, my, like I'm getting more and more nausea. Like I got physically sick <laughs> oh, no. watching, watching it. And I, people love it for the hijinks. Yeah. And obviously there's drama because like, oh, this kid's wrecking his dad's Ferrari yep. and his brother or his, uh, his best friend is, is uh, steamrolling him into yep. doing it. And you're like, I can't believe this is horrible. I, my, my stomach is going up in knots, but other people get a great kick out of it. So that one is a perfect example of like what, what they intend for evil. I can use for good. <laughs> well, right. Because the and, whole, the movie ends and Ferris Bueller has been this absolute demon to yep. everybody around him and everything works out and he gets the blame for none of it. Yeah. And it's, it's every, it's every human <laughs> being's wet dream 
I can do anything I want and I don't have to <laughs> suffer the consequences for anything. And everybody right. else takes the fall for me. This is great. And here's why I like it. Um, and this is the purpose I put the, the use I think it has that can be, uh, while not entirely redeemed, uh, while it can function in the imagination of a, of a Christian teenager in a healthy way, I wish more Christians acted like Ferris Bueller when it came to the state and when it came to institutions around us right now. What we need is about a million and a half Bible believing Christians to have that amount of flippancy and disrespect for Babylon. I would disagree, but we're at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, I like what you said earlier about um, the logic being the excuse or the, the fruit of our affection. Like we've already made the decision. Have you seen 12 angry men? Yeah. I think that film is a really great example of that because yeah. he doesn't go in and browbeat people with logic. He goes in and he literally changes 11 guys' minds. And if, the end obviously is the most spectacular where you've yeah. got this guy. Oh, the reason he's voting guilty is because he's angry at his son and he's vicariously giving the death penalty, which he actually wishes for his own son on this random guy. Yeah. And that's when it comes out. That's really what the issue was. Yep. And it's a, so think, think of human beings as porcupines. Like do not think that the quills are in any way, the cause of that animal's location. <laughs> like they are the defense of that animal's location. Mm. And, and we mount terrific defenses. And I think every one of us, it doesn't matter. It does not matter what worldview you have or what philosophy you have or where you originate. Every one of us has been in an argument with people where we give them a perfectly excellent argument and then it's unacceptable and it just doesn't matter. And it's so somebody trots out a defense of their position and you say, here is the lethal blow to that defense. They immediately drop that argument. That argument goes away. Like they acknowledge that it was just destroyed, but they don't relocate. They in no way change their position and they will not until their affections change, meaning they feel some level of shame or with the porcupine, you get them through the stomach, which is where there's no exactly defenses. flip them over and eat that belly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's so the, the thing it's really, there's a lot of interesting things to talk about here, but you just said we're out of time, but it's, it, I, I will say this, it is, um, is a testimony of a real honest debate partner or discussion partner of somebody who will say, you know what? You're right. I was wrong. Dad, that's wrong. I'll have to rethink that. Like that, that is a really abnormal human behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and those people are really fun to talk to Christopher Hitchens in the film collision. When we, the first movie I was involved in, uh, one of the things that really shocked me was watching him and it, it didn't shock me, I should say, but it surprised me, uh, watch him trot out an argument that just got body slammed. I don't even, I don't remember which argument it was, but it just got torched. And afterwards behind the scenes, he approached my father and asked him like, okay, so I've never heard that before. That's really interesting. And like acknowledged that his argument that he'd attempted was flawed and defeated. Like, okay, yeah, that's fair. The very next debate, he trotted out the exact same argument, but tried to do it in a way that he could move on and not allow the airspace for the defeat of that argument where it's one of those things where he's, and it made me realize he is not nothing that he's doing here is about truth. He doesn't think this is, this isn't about truth. This is all about his affections. This is about his, this is all wrapped up in his insecurities as a teenager and his relationship with his brother and to his parents and, and everything else, because he already acknowledged to us that this is, this is flawed and doesn't work. And now he's using it in public on camera in front of hundreds of people, knowing that like fully aware of that fact. And that was a really interesting moment for me in, in developing this way of thinking and realizing that, uh, people adopt their positions, then defend their positions. And if you want to move somebody, 
you have to find the root cause of why they're there and then try to address that. Ignore all the quills and try to get to that belly. Is that your secret storytelling weapon? Yeah, that's part of it. That's a big part of it. That's that's the goal. Hit him, hit him through the heart. Don't get hit it, him yeah. through the... Or the belly. We can go with the belly. There's Stay a the reason that stories belly. sell better than uh, nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, thanks so much for the interview. Yeah, Indeed. very fun. And maybe we'll do it again. Thanks sometime. for being persistent. And you're wait, welcome. Waiting through all those unanswered messages. Yeah. What was it like? 20, 20 emails back and forth, I think. Was it really? I get this. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for your persistence. Very fun conversation. Thank you. If you'd like to look into some of N.D. Wilson's books, you can go to N as in Nathan, D as in David, Wilson.com, ndwilson.com.